we bow in thy presence, O Lord. We honor thy name. We would rejoice in the greatness of our God and Savior. And we thank thee that the eternal purposes of grace which have been directed toward us uh, have uh, been uh, brought to pass, that uh, uh, life and salvation and immortality have been uh, brought to light in the appearing of our Lord Jesus in his uh, coming to be that servant of the Lord who should be wounded for the transgressions of his people. We thank thee then that our sins have been uh, satisfied, the punishment that was due to them has uh, been uh, fully executed in the uh, death of our Lord who gave himself up for us, who loved us and, and came to be our savior. And we pray that uh, thy love for us might uh, bring forth from our hearts a, a deep and a genuine, uh, warm and burning love for thee that will show itself in in real ways from day to day in the way that we live and, and, and think and conduct ourselves in this world. We thank thee that thy word opens up the meaning of uh, not just our individual lives, but of the whole course of history and of thy dealings, thou who art the creator of the ends of the earth and hast uh, made things uh, so that they are destined for an ultimate uh, consummation, a consummation that will be a, a full revelation of thy glory. We thank thee that uh, thou dost uh, make known to us the, the pattern of the ages, uh, the way in which that thou art leading thy people redemptively uh, to their eternal home. Uh, may we study the scriptures and be given wisdom of thee by thy spirit to understand so that we may know the, uh, the nature of the times in which we live so that we might conduct ourselves as leaders of thy people with uh, uh, wisdom and in a way that will be uh, able to encourage them and comfort them in the way for, O oh Lord, we see that this uh, present existence is a uh, one in which uh, the church must exercise patience uh, before thee, enduring a hardship in the name of Christ in the midst of a world which is uh, informed by the spirit of an antichrist. And uh, so we lift up before thee the cause of the Lord Jesus in his church. Uh, be thou the defense and the strength and the rock of thy people. And uh, through thy church, we pray thee, fulfill thy uh, purposes of uh, of evangelizing the, the nations of the world and, and, and bringing to faith the, the elect from every kindred and tribe and, and people. So instruct us out of the words of prophecy that we shall be engaged with in this, these hours together. Uh, and teach us of uh, the way in, in which we should walk as the, the people of, of God serving thee in uh, this uh, present time. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are our immediate concern, and <clears throat> in each of them we have a, this overall pattern where the world empires from the time of uh, the termination of the typological Davidic kingdom on to the end of history are sketched for us, from one case under the symbolism of the great statue, and we dealt with that in chapter 2, and now in chapter 7 under the imagery of, of the four beasts and uh, the figure of the Son of Man who represents the fifth kingdom, uh, the, uh, the kingdom of God. And as we uh, pursued then, we know the particular identities of the first three, and we come to the fourth one, and it's divided into the two stages, uh, A and B, uh, and uh, we have discussed uh, the uh, division, the dividing line between these two, and, and to, and uh, seeing how that it is uh, uh, at, at the point where the covenant community is no longer localized as uh, uh, in the land of Canaan, where the world power that happens to be dominating uh, uh, the, uh, that territory then represents the, the beast. But uh, w when you come to the new covenant, that's no longer the case. The people of God are dispersed all over the world. And, and by the same token then, what is represented and symbolized by the beast has to take on those same uh, universal uh, proportions. And so the, in chapter 2, the uh, feet of iron and, and clay represented that uh, a new stage. And uh, then we were noticing how in chapter uh, uh, 7, it's, it's uh, uh, the little horn that comes up uh, in uh, the midst of of the other ten horns on, on the head of the, the fourth beast. It's that little horn 
uh, that uh, represents this uh, stage uh, and as, as over against uh, views such as, for example, E.J. Young that would identify the little horn just with the, the, the final uh, crisis. At the end of the church age, we were taking the position here that that little horn represents that whole development from that dividing from 4A to 4B in the history of the beast. The little horn represents uh, the, the whole development of the, the world powers uh, from the time being quite specific of, of uh, 70 AD on uh, because uh, the little, this little horn's activities are, are said to extend over the span of the three and a half years, which symbol we uh, have uh, studied and seen represents indeed uh, that uh, the second half of the 70th week, which begins with 70 AD and goes on to the end of the age. So here's this figure of the little horn uh, representing the world powers uh, and uh, with the emphasis we saw in chapter 7 uh, on uh, the, the power, the destructive power of the beast, uh, but not only so, uh, but destructive power directed not only against one another, one world nation rising up against another, but the, the emphasis is on the destructive power of the, of the little horn uh, directed in hatred and hostility against in the saints whom he persecutes. And, and we even have the ominous kind of statement that he prevails a, against them in uh, this uh, uh, warfare in the course of these uh, three and a half times, which are, are the present church age. Well, we were trying then to to uh, understand the, the little horn of Daniel 7, more particularly in, in, in the light of the expansion of this whole theme that you get in the New Testament apocalypse. And uh, the, the, that led us then to look at Revelation 13. Uh, and uh, Revelation 13, we, we first had occasion to turn to when we were trying to bring out the the dimension of the story uh, whereby we should see it as a creation event, a recreation event. And uh, the whole seventh chapter that we saw began with the thought of the four great winds uh, blowing upon the great sea. And, and, uh, and this is just one installment in the ongoing repeated story of, of creation of the Ruach o over the waters, bringing forth the, uh, the kingdom in the case of, of God's creation, the kingdom of the Son of Man, the one made in the likeness of, of God. In, in the case of... Uh, of Satan, it's uh, as he stands by the waters, Revelation uh, 12, last verse, chapter 13, first verse, that, that picture as the Satan stands by the sea, he brings forth the, the kingdom in, in his own likeness. It's, it's a, a beast with seven heads and, and ten horns in the, in the likeness of his uh, father, the dragon. You get a all kinds of these counterfeits then so Satan is the Satan is the, the counterfeit uh, creator on this occasion and uh, we, we notice that there are this, the counterfeit names the, the, the real creator is the one who is and who was and who is to come and here we were noticing in chapter 17 especially a revelation the language that uh, uh, Satan is uh, the, the one uh, who was and who is not and who is to come, but then to go uh, to perdition. And so there, there, there's enough of similarity to see that there's a counterfeiting of God's name. And yet, of course, uh, the great uh, differences are, are, are there as well. And, um, well, there are other ways. So uh, that, that whole thought of, of uh, the counter deity, the whole pattern of it might. Uh, uh, it be developed. Uh, I just suggest this as a possibility uh, that uh, that the dragon himself, in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Trinity, might be compared to the Father, huh? And, and the beast that is made in, in the likeness uh, of uh, of the dragon w would be the equivalent of the Son, and uh, that's the beast from the sea, and then uh, the. Uh, uh, the, the beast from the land of the false prophet uh, who who witnesses to the uh, to, to the beast could be compared uh, to the, the the third person of uh, the Trinity 
and then the image that uh, they, they set up uh, that everyone should uh, uh, worship, sort of a repetition of the Daniel 3 type of thing where Nebuchadnezzar sets up the image, well, Revelation 13, they set up the, the, the image and, and that image uh, the then could correspond uh, in, in the original pattern of creation to man, so the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and, and the man in the image of God, uh, that whole pattern is uh, repeated uh, uh, there. Um, just while talking about this uh, sort of thing, there, there may be another one that we might mention that would have some bearing on, on uh, the interpretation of that Mikael, Michael thing that uh, we've uh, touched upon a couple of times, and including uh, uh, here when we're dealing with the Son of Man and the view that, uh, that uh, he's to be related to the Michael of, of Daniel 12. Um, uh, Mikael is, is the name then, uh, as I see it, of, of, uh, of the Son of God in terms of his angelic mode of, of revelation. Who, who, is, who is like Ael? Hmm? And uh, so the, the beast has to imitate that. And so the, the people are all crying out when they see the, the beast perform his of work. Uh, who can make war like, uh, or who is, who, is, uh, who is like the beast to make war and so on? It's that same sort of question in interpreting him. Uh, who is like the beast, huh? Uh, this one is the beast, and then there's none other like him. And uh, the same way, uh, then, who is like Ael? This one is Ael, and, and who else is like him? I think that comparison of those two formulas, the one where who is like the beast identifies the, the, the one who is thus labeled as the beast, and the other side, Mikael, who is like Ale, identifies the one who bears that name a, a, as Ale. And so there are all, all of these uh, uh, interesting uh, parallels in this whole pattern of, of counterfeiting. Well, coming back then uh, to this uh, fourth beast, and, uh, and it has 10 horns, and uh, then the little one that comes up in the midst, and I've taken the <coughs> position that the beast with the ten horns is already the, 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 there at the, the beginning. That, that is 4A, that's the fourth beast in stage A, A, right from the start, the ten horns representing the widespread nature of the Roman Empire all, all along. And then <coughs> the little horn, as we just said, would, uh, would uh, represent the world kingdoms uh, more broadly, and, uh, in the, the configuration of nations uh, that this has been on uh, the, the, the scene from uh, the uh, first century down to the uh, present time. And uh, now then, we want to look at Revelation 13 again uh, to, to see the light that it sh sheds on the, the character of, of this little horn. Uh, and uh, to confirm the thought that uh, I'm, I'm defending here, that this little horn is one who represents the, the satanic hostility all the way through the, the church age. So it's not just the theme of, of re recreation that gets uh, supported by Revelation 13, but it's uh, also the, the, the light it shows on, uh, on uh, the length of the little horn's career and the character of the little horn's uh, career, and uh, that they certainly match up uh, as you uh, compare the particular features that are emphasized in, Daniel 7 about the little horn and the features that are emphasized about the, the fourth beast in, uh, in chapter 13. Now that fourth beast, in the, uh, that, that, that beast in, in uh, Revelation 13, um, with the features of the first three beasts of Daniel 7, it's uh, a leopard with the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. Uh, those, those are the three beasts that you have, of course, in Daniel 7. So already we, we can see from that one feature that the, the beast from the sea in Revelation 13, called forth by the dragon, uh, represents the, the, the whole history of, represented by the three beasts in, in Daniel uh, uh, seven plus, of course, <coughs> the, the fourth one, whose history now is given in in more detail. So, what is seen as sort of a four separate beasts in Daniel seven uh, uh, is now pictured that that whole same history is now pictured in the form of just this one beast, this underlying concept that the bestial satanic. Uh, uh, power that is uh, present in, in Babylon, you know, Persia, Greece, and Rome, that, that's all united now in, in, in one basic concept. 
and uh, this is our, our beast, the beast then with the ten horns, from whom then there emerges uh, the, uh, the eleventh. Uh, by the way, another thing that we, we started to get into uh, in, in Revelation 17 concerning this beast was that he had seven heads, and, and five of them uh, belonged to past history. Mm -hmm. And one of them was and future one was coming. I think I may have misled someone who was asking a question toward the end of the hour as to where in the text uh, that was. We were also talking about uh, he was and he is not and uh, it is to come. And uh, that, of course, is in uh, uh, Revelation 17. And I, and I think I said that if you were looking for this other business of the five heads and the sixth and the seventh, that that was in Daniel, in, in Revelation 13. No, that, that also is uh, there in, in, in Revelation 17 if you're looking for uh, these particular details. But the, the, the fact now that this beast has these seven heads and five of them represent past history, well, that past history equals, I would say, you know, the, the, the four beasts of, uh, of uh, Daniel 7, not now represented in, in terms of these five heads and the sixth one, and then uh, the one that must yet come, and somehow this underlying satanic bestial power itself uh, that comes to expression in these particular ways is an eighth one, and of, of the seven, sort of, we suggest that they are almost the thought of a of a, something of a, a satanic, in, in, if not incarnation, sort of a total possession uh, that takes place in the, uh, when we come to the Antichrist uh, stage. Now, on our understanding of it then, uh, the little horn of Daniel 7 then uh, represents more particularly uh, the, the beast in the stage represented by these particular heads. Not what has already gone by, uh, but uh, from this point on. Back in chapter 17, uh, this particular point of division, at the, at, at, I say 17, I meant in chapter 13. In, in Revelation 13, uh, we read about the uh, one of the heads of, of, of the, the beast uh, had uh, received a fatal wound and uh, yet had uh, uh, survived. And everyone therefore wondered at the beast who had received the fatal wound and yet he survives. And I would uh, suggest then uh, that, that that concept of the delivering of the fatal wound from which nevertheless somehow uh, the, the satanic uh, enterprise continues should be understood in terms of the, the effects of our Lord's uh, victory in his first coming. What elsewhere is described, uh, well, for example, in chapter 12, uh, as the victory of Michael and his angels over Satan and his angels that resulted in Satan being cast out of heaven. That was the, it would seem like the, the fatal wound and might have been the end of the story, but, but yet he survives. And so I think if we want to identify one of the the seven heads as the one that received the fatal wound and yet is continuing, it would have to be that sixth one. So at the cross, uh, uh, he received the, the fatal wound, and, and we know the ultimate outcome, what it's going to be when our Lord returns the, the second uh, time. Uh, uh, but meanwhile, uh, Satan is uh, uh, permitted uh, to continue in the world, uh, represented now by this... Uh, uh, sixth head and uh, climactically to be followed uh, by a seventh one, a sixth one and, and yet as chapter 17 brings out though he continues, though the wound is uh, healed and, and, he, and, and he survives uh, the, the victory of the cross and the resurrection though he survives it yet in some sense he is not mm. he, he isn't what he used to be anymore, he's thrown out of heaven uh, until that point all through the history of, of the first five heads, he was the deceiver of the world. He was the deceiver of the nations. Where was the people of God at this time? Oh, there it is, that tiny little enclave over there in, in, uh, in, in Palestine and all of the rest of the world 
uh, lies caught in the coils of the great dragon uh, and, and, and under his deception in the darkness uh, of uh, ignorance and, and unbelief and, and the light of the gospel is, is uh, re- restricted uh, uh, up until messianic times uh, uh, to the confines of, of the community of, of, of Israel. And uh, that's no longer true now. Hmm. The victory has been won. The fatal blow has uh, has been uh, delivered. And though Satan continues, he is not. He is not what he used to be. He is not what he characteristically is has been in the past. The deceiver of of uh, the nations, and uh, yet he is to come. And uh, he is to come up from from the abyss, tying in Revelation 20 into the story, huh? Uh, it, it, that the background is the same. Uh, he, he, he was not bound until Christ came. And then the stronger one comes uh, and binds the strong man and proceeds to, to, uh, uh, to take the spoils of his house and his captives and set uh, them uh, free. And, and uh, so the gospel penetrates the nations of, of, of <laughs> the world and, and, and uh, those who have been captive to Satan are uh, are, are, are set free as demonstrated already in, in Jesus' deliverance of the, the demon possessed and, and so on when, when he was uh, with us and uh, so now he, he is not, now he is bound is the equivalent of that so Revelation 20 equals uh, Revelation 17 in terms of this matchup between Satan is not and he is bound and uh, yet, as we know from this context, he, although he is not, in some ways, uh, he is. And, and likewise, of course, we know that although he is bound, he is still the roaring lion who is going around and very active, uh, persecuting the saints at uh, this time. And just as did the beast in chapter uh, 17 of Revelation uh, 17 here, uh, is to come to a new stage where he comes up from, from the abyss uh, back in chapter 11 of the book of Revelation where the, the, the church, the history of the church is being set forth in terms of the, the image of the, of the, the two prophet uh, figures and to where during you know, the, our, our three and a half times uh, they are empowered to fulfill the great commission. Satan can't stop them. Uh, he, he's bound. He can't stop these two witnesses from fulfilling their task. Yet when they have completed their task, the beast from the abyss comes up. The, the, the world power in, in that final stage of its career where it is, comes up from the abyss and uh, then of course it says that it actually slays. So we're, we're, we come to that crisis that we're interested in saying just, just what's the nature of that crisis and we keep encountering it at various places in that Revelation 11. It's the crisis where the where the two prophet figures are silenced in, 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 in death. It's the time when, in chapter 17, the beast comes up from the, 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 the abyss. In chapter 20, it's where Satan comes up from the abyss. You see, the equivalence, the equivalence of chapter 17 and of chapter 20 is, is carried out further in the, the, the similar nature of, of the crisis and, and the involvement of the beast on the one hand, Satan on the other, and each one. After all, Satan doesn't function in the abstract. He's, he's, he, he functions through the beast. And so you, it isn't that the beast has one career and Satan has another and, and aren't related. No, they, they intermesh. And so here, the beast comes up from the abyss. Satan is on, uh, let loose from being bound. But in each case, of course, they, they enter the the field of history and, and, and the role of the, the great uh, uh, and destroyer, uh, destroyers of, of the church uh, just to precipitate the second coming of Christ. But the decisive victory was there. Uh, the, the total execution of, of his, his judgment comes here and so the, the beast is destroyed and, uh, and uh, of course Satan then is also destroyed. Both of them alike are thrown into uh, the, the lake of, uh, of fire, and uh, so the, the, that's the, the pattern that that emerges, and uh, and it's into that pattern then that we have to fit our little horn of of, of Daniel 
seven. Now, in terms of uh, his, uh, the nature of his career, let's just uh, see how uh, things match up. Uh, in uh, Daniel 7, verses 8, 11, 20, and 25, we get the feature of this little horn uh, as having a, you know, he has eyes, he has eyes like a man, and he has a mouth, and uh, the mouth is uh, then one that is uh, a blaspheming mouth. It's, uh, he blasphemes God, and, <coughs> and an aspect of this blaspheming of God, of course, is that he, he, he takes to himself the claims of, of deity, and so he sets himself form, uh, forth as, as God, and of course, th thereby uh, uh, blasphemes God, and, but also as a result of him setting himself forth as God, and, and uh, because of the uh, deceptive uh, uh, signs and wonders that he performs, and, uh, and, uh, and the role of the propaganda machine of, uh, of the, the beast from the, the land, the, the, the second beast. As a result of that, many receive the mark of the beast and his image, and they worship uh, the beast. Uh, uh, so uh, Daniel 7, the little horn has this blasphemous mouth. In Revelation 13, verses 5 and 6, uh, the, uh, uh, the beast uh, of chapter 13 uh, is the one with the blasphemous mouth and the one who is a, a worship. Then there's the matter of the warring against the saints in, in Daniel 7, verse 25. Uh, as, I, as I said yesterday, you don't get this detail in, in the, the initial description of, of uh, the, the beast and the little horn and so on, but you get it in the interpretation afterwards uh, that he directs his, uh, his uh, power against the saints And uh, Daniel 7, 25. And uh, likewise then in Revelation uh, 13, uh, 7, well, why don't we start with the fifth verse, making uh, the point we just did. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place, those who live in heaven. So that matches up with the little horn and, and his big mouth. And then verse uh, 7 here in Revelation 13, uh, this beast was given power to make war against the saints, and uh, the NIV translates, uh, and to conquer them, other versions, uh, to prevail uh, against them. And he's given authority over every tribe, people, language, and, and nation, okay? We're, we are once again uh, here in this part of the description, it's, it's taking us right to the climax of the history again, at that point where Satan is unbound, and goes forth, and once again becomes the deceiver of, of uh, the, the world in a more general way, and uh, that's uh, intimated uh, here. The, the, the detail we stressed of the three and a half times, which serves to identify the two. In chapter 7, verse 25, again in Daniel, it says then that he prevails in his war against the saints four, three and a half times, and we just saw the same thing here in, in of the beast of Revelation 13. Uh, that uh, he exercised this authority for, for the 42 months, which is, of course, in terms of months, the equivalent of three and a half uh, uh, years. So uh, at major point after major point, uh, our little horn of Daniel 7 is to be equated with the, the beast of, of Revelation uh, 13. And um, the destruction of them ultimately is similar, too, by the way. Uh, ultimately, this... This beast is destroyed in fire, uh, just as in uh, Daniel 7, uh, the, the little horn, and for that matter, the, the beast uh, from whose head uh, he emerges, uh, also destroyed by fire. So there, there, there should be no question about the equation then of uh, little horn, Daniel 7, with this beast of Revelation 13, this beast that spans the whole history of the church, and one day will come to a, an antichrist uh, 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 crisis, uh, but uh, more specifically than as uh, we've said, uh, it is the beast of Revelation 13 in those phases represented by heads 6 and, and 7 that would correspond to the little horn because that's the period of the three and a half years. Question next. I, I think you can think the little horn is everything after 70 years yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that three and a half times thing that I, th I think is so useful for integrating the different passages. I don't know. 
All right, we uh, then getting back to Daniel 7, I suggested the outline of the passage in terms of, uh, of the creation motif of the uh, counterfeit creation 1 through 8 and uh, the decreation, the act of judgment in uh, verses 9 through 12, and then the, the recreation in terms of the, uh, of the saints possessing the kingdom in verses 13 and, and 14. So uh, we uh, said sufficiently about the verses 1 through 8, the, the counterfeit creation we've just been analyzing. This is Satan's counter creation. This kingdom of the beast, this kingdom of <coughs> the little horn, uh, that's the counterfeit creation. <coughs> now we come to the theme of, of, of the destruction of it, the, the decreation, uh, which is, is prelude uh, to recreation because <coughs> clean, cleansing, the, cleansing the temple, hmm? uh, the, the function of holy war. Uh, and cleansing the land of Canaan of uh, the, the Canaanite idolaters. Uh, the, that is the necessary prerequisite to uh, the establishment of uh, God's holy house and temple and, and, and kingdom. The land must be sanctified. It must be cleansed of, of uh, that which is evil. And so uh, there, must be, there must be the judgment of the world power here. And, and this, of course, is our... Uh, uh, sort of our major thesis that we're uh, developing in, in terms of, uh, of uh, analysis of the, the millennial views, our main thesis is precisely this, that uh, <coughs> at, at the point of, of parousia, which ends in the, the three and a half year span of the present church age, the, the judgment takes place and it's one that simultaneously marks the end of the world so that it doesn't exist anymore and the introduction of the eternal kingdom of God uh, right at, at that point and so our, our, our contention is that the, the kingdom of glory yeah, the kingdom of glory does not get introduced on the scene until this holy war, this cleansing of the temple has taken place and and, and uh, God's cosmos is, is freed of the presence of, of, of Satan and an evil. Now it's ready to, uh, to uh, be the foundation uh, of his holy house, his, his new uh, Jerusalem. Now, that's, that's the pattern that, that is uh, clearly emerging again here in Daniel 7 as it was in Daniel 2. And uh, it's the one, as we said, that can be accommodated uh, successfully only by an amillennial view because... Uh, uh, and here, this consummation of history, this great white throne judgment, which ends uh, uh, the world here for the first time, uh, the kingdom comes in glory, whereas both premillennialism and uh, postmillennial views have the coming of the kingdom in glory uh, before the consummation. Uh, and uh, so the, this is what we are seeing again <clears throat> here at this point. And, uh, the decreation of the world is, is a bringing to a, a total end uh, the, the, the presence of the, the satanic enterprise. Now, of course, uh, it's a fascinating scene. It's the coming of uh, the uh, Ancient of Days. <coughs> and uh, by the way, in, in all of this imagery <coughs> in Daniel 7, um, if you read the, the literature, you'll see how people recognize <coughs> the way in, in which here, excuse me, <coughs> uh, I, when we were talking about creation, we, we noticed, of course, that there were creation myths <coughs> and uh, that the Bible in re representing God's role in creation would make sort of a polemical use of, of, of the coloring and the details uh, uh, from the, the, the perversions of the original creation story, the perversions that you have in, in uh, the myths, and uh, the, the, uh, the details, almost literal quotations at certain points of, of some of the language in the, the, the mythical literature will be found demythologized in the, in the Bible, of course, to describe God's activity in the original <coughs> creation. Well, the same thing is true here when the Bible comes to tell about recreation, uh, that uh, that same uh, mythical literature that you're familiar with from, from our previous discussion is uh, 
is, is seen to uh, have all kinds of parallels. So now, for example, the, the Ancient of Days mm, in, in the Ugaritic texts, uh, you know, they, they have the same uh, imagery. Uh, uh, it's the Ancient of Days They're sitting there in the midst of the heavenly council. It's like Psalm 82, isn't it? Uh, where, where God takes his stand in the midst of the council of God, in the midst of the other Elohim creatures. That whole scene is, <coughs> is what, what we have here in, <coughs> in Daniel 7 when he's, he looks and the, the thrones were set and the, <coughs> the Ancient of Days uh, took his seat. His clothing <coughs> is white as snow, the hair of his head white like wool and, and, and so on. Uh, well, in, in, in the Canaanite myths, uh, you know, they have their perverted form of it. And uh, it isn't that the Bible has been taken over from uh, the myth. The myth is a perversion of the, the genuine tradition that the Bible represents. But the scriptures then do make use of, of some of the, of, uh, the details. Now, the equivalent, the equivalent of the Lord and the, the uh, Canaanite myths would be a, a, the, the god Ale. Hmm? And Hale is uh, one who is described as the father of years. He's the ancient of days, uh, that type of thing. So there are all kinds of interesting parallels all of the way uh, through that you have to be aware of and uh, that you have to know how to, to deal with in terms of your understanding of the scripture as the word of God and how it does relate to all of these other things. So you can't avoid it by saying that the parallels aren't there. They are there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to think through your, your whole uh, structure of revelation and how it is integrated with these other things, uh, which is, uh, as I say, what we had to face when we dealt with creation. But here it is again when we uh, deal with uh, uh, recreation. And so some would uh, try to you know, draw the parallel further than the, the, that like Ale would be the equivalent of, uh, of uh, the, the, the God of the Lord and uh, and, uh, and Baal might be thought of then as, as the equivalent of, of the son of a man and, and all, all kinds of such parallels are, are, are dealt with and, and then going on of course to the, to the role of Baal as, as the one who, uh, who conquers the, 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 the chaos forces, uh, the dragon forces uh, which would be the equivalent uh, then of the son of man figure here uh, who uh, presumably is the one who, who executes the judgment on, on the beast and the, the little horn, although Daniel 7 doesn't explicitly uh, uh, make that point, but we know from elsewhere that Christ is the, the dragon slayer, obviously. That's the biblical uh, representation. And so Baal is the one uh, in, in the mythical perversion of this uh, uh, who does battle with with Yam, the god of the sea, and, and Moth, the god of death, and, and, and who wins the victory over them. Although, meanwhile, he uh, has to uh, undergo death. Huh? He, and, and he has to become a dying, rising god in order uh, to complete his uh, victory, Baal does. Uh, and uh, but ultimately, he wins the victory. And then, of course, his house is, is built for, for him as the seat of his uh, sovereignty. So that whole pattern uh, that we find here in terms of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Son of Man figure, has its um, perverted mythological reflections, and uh, you know I, I think that uh, you know the, the, the reflections, perverted as they are, are, are useful because uh, the, the, they show what is going on uh, in, in some way uh, here. Uh, and for example, at this point, although Daniel, as we uh, say, seven itself doesn't uh, speak about the, the Son of Man as, as the one who uh, inflicts the, 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 the fiery de death on the beast, that, that in the light of the whole pattern, biblical and extra biblical, it, it's uh, I, I think clear that we must see the Son of Man as the, the one who, who does fulfill that role. Well, here here is the judgment scene, and it's. Uh, uh, the, the motif of judicial ordeal that we have seen so often in the flood episode, for example, uh, where there are the rival claimants to the, the kingdom of God, and uh, and uh, how do you settle the matter? You settle it by ordeal, and so you you subject the world to, in that case, the the, the, the liquid. It wasn't a river of fire; it was a, a river of water. Huh? It was the the, the flood ordeal, and uh, so God renders his is a judicial verdict. It's, it's a court scene. Uh, appeal is made to heaven. He heaven will settle this matter. From the midst of the divine council, the decree will go forth, and, and uh, the, it will be a decree in, in, in favor of, of the saints of the Most High. 
And so the, the court sits, and, and the whole description of it here in Daniel 7 is one that uh, I think compels us to, to, to uh, tie it in with the great white throne judgment uh, in, uh, in uh, Revelation 20. So the, the, the scenery is the same, and the, the court is sitting, and, and, and so on. That same language is in Revelation 20. And uh, so this scene, which uh, is the scene of judgment, it comes at this point in, in the history of the, of the little horn. Uh, is to be equated then with the great white throne scene in, in Revelation 20. And that great white throne scene in, in, in Revelation 20 is something that follows a thousand years. It is the end of, uh, end of the world. It follows a thousand years. It marks the end uh, of uh, all of history. And uh, so there too is, uh, uh, is some further indication of, of where the millennium belongs. The great white throne of Revelation 20 is the equivalent of, the, of this judgment scene in Daniel 7. The judgment scene in Daniel 7 is one that comes at the end of the present age, uh, ergo the, the millennium of Revelation 20 that leads up to that it must, must be uh, identified with uh, this pre-parousia uh, 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 pre-judgment uh, uh, period in, in, in history. Uh, uh, all right, so judicial principle, uh, wa fire ordeal instead of water, the same sort of point that Peter makes in Second Peter where he compares the two episodes as judgments, one by water and then again um, by fire, as in all of these judicial ordeals, dual verdicts, dual verdicts. There is, there's both vindication and there's condemnation. There's both inheritance of life and there's handing over to death as, as the dual results, depending on whether you are in the right or not in the right in, in, as a result of this uh, or, or deal. But what we want to emphasize then is that the outcome uh, of this is uh, uh, the complete destruction, the uh, complete destruction of the world power. So the, the beast uh, and, and little horn and so on, now uh, that is described uh, after the verses 9 and 10 have uh, depicted the, the heavenly court. Thrones were set in place till the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. There's your heavenly court, the, the retinue of the royal uh, divine king. Uh, the court was seated, the books were opened, and of course, <coughs> that is the language that introduces uh, the uh, great white throne uh, seen in uh, Revelation uh, in, in 20. So that's <coughs> the Antichrist episode. Mm -hmm and at the end of the millennium, the great white throne are, are being brought together. And that, of course, is a major thing we want to do, is to, to show that, uh, that the Gog Magog figure who is associated with the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium in Revelation 20 is to be identified, and that Gog figure is to be identified with this little horn antichrist figure who appears at the parousia, so that you get welded together what premillennialists would put asunder the parousia uh, and, uh, and uh, the Gog Magog uh, episode. There, there is no thousand years after the parousia e event. Uh, uh, that is uh, <coughs> uh, the same episode as the Gog uh, who comes at the end of the millennium, therefore the millennium is, uh, uh, comes before the parousia. Well, I continue to watch now the timing of this. This, this judicial episode, the precise timing of it, uh, as uh, to be seen as the, the second coming of, of Christ, is uh, indicated by the, the occasion. Uh, Daniel says, I continue to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. So here's the little horn for three and a half times. He's been speaking his boastful words and he's blaspheming against the Lord. And uh, now we come to the, the climax of that. It's not the beginning of the church age, huh? Uh, the, the, this uh, scene, you know, more conservative commentators, I, I think, uh, 
the debate back and forth. Should, should this be equated with the first coming of Christ uh, or, or the second coming? I think the, the answer is plain. It's, a, it's after the final Antichrist crisis, after the little horn has been active for the whole three and a half times. And uh, John's, uh, uh, Daniel's um, watching that and he's concerned what's going to be the outcome. Well, I kept looking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and his body destroyed and it was thrown into the blazing fire. And uh, so uh, there is the, the end of the holy war. It has cleansed the, the, the temple. The world power does not exist anymore. It has come to an end. No beast, no little horn, no nothing. And uh, well, what about the other th uh, beasts? Hmm? And so parenthetically, uh, we, we have a statement here in verse 12, and that, that's uh, important to, to understand uh, properly. Uh, there's a clear statement of what happens to the, the fourth beast with the little horn. He's just wiped out completely here by this act of, uh, of judgment. What had happened to the other three? And now, you know, I say so many uh, things against the NIV here and there, and uh, they, they deserve it here and there. And, uh, <laughs> but here's one where I think they're on the right track. Uh, and in two respects, and if you look at Daniel 7, verse 12, uh, what the NIV fellows did with this was uh, to make it parenthetical. That's good. And they also made it pluperfect. Parenthetical and pluperfect. Now, it has brought us right to the end of history with the destruction of the fourth uh, and the last beast. Now, what about those the first three beasts? Well, the other beasts had been, perfect, each in their turn, had been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to live for a period of time. Now, what's happening here is uh, there's a contrast between the kind of judgment that the Lord is inflicting on Satan and, and his kingdom and the kind of judgments that the, the first three kingdoms uh, were inflicting on one another. Now, the Medo-Persians overcame the Babylonians, all right? But the Babylonians lived on uh, as part of the Medo-Persian kingdom. And Greece and Alexander, they conquered the Medo-Persian kingdom, but the Medo-Persian kingdom then in turn continued and, and lived on in, uh, in the larger Greek empire. And then, in turn, Rome conquered Greece, but in the process absorbed Greece. And in that absorption, Greece continued and were allowed to live for a period of time. So when, amid the, the wars and the rumors of wars of the nations and f the fighting against nations, one nation overcomes another, you know, that is not, not the, the, the ultimate end and, and uh, elimination uh, from the scene of history of, of the, the, the subordinate to overcome power. And uh, they continue on. Not like that, huh? Not like that is uh, what God does at the, the end of history. Now, when he deals with this final manifestation of the beast power, uh, it doesn't live on again after that point. Yeah, after the first coming of Christ, ooh, the beast had received a, a mortal wound, and, and yet he lived on in the purposes of God uh, until the end of the church age. There's, there's no living beyond the, for the beast this judgment uh, inflicted by the Ancient of Days uh, on the beast and, and the little uh, uh, horn. Now, inflicted by the Ancient of Days, yes, of course, by the Ancient of, of Days, and, and yet... Uh, through some agent, yes, I, I think through an agent, and I think it's for that reason then that immediately the heavenly scene is supplemented uh, after the, the description of, of the, the judgment, the elimination of the world power, uh, it, it's, it's supplemented uh, by uh, the introduction of the figure of the Baranash, of the son of, of, of man. Uh, he is introduced at this point, I, I, I think precisely because he is the one, the messianic agent of the Lord, who is, who is the actual uh, dragon slayer. And so having described this victory of the Son of, of Man, now the other thing that's noticed simultaneously happens as soon as the beast is destroyed, and not before, now the Son of Man receives his reward, the reward of his victory. He receives the, the kingdom, and not just the Son of Man, but as the uh, angel's interpretation uh, goes on to expound, 
all of the saints of the Most High, uh, the, the body of, uh, of the Son of Man, who is the head of this uh, church, uh, they together now perceive that the kingdom uh, uh, of, of glory. And there's nothing beyond that. This is the parousia. The world's eliminated. God's kingdom has come, universal, eternal, no more interruptions, no limited phases of the kingdom like a millennium, least of all a millennium then that issues in a God made God crisis uh, somewhere later down. There's no place uh, for that in, in, in this very simple eschatological pattern of Dad, Daniel uh, 7. There's simply no place for that kind of speculation. We, we are driven to recognize. Uh, that if the Bible speaks somewhere else uh, uh, about a, a Gog, Magog, it can't be anything beyond this point. It has to be identified as one and the same crisis as uh, we, we are dealing uh, with here. And if it speaks about some limited phase of the kingdom of God, such as a thousand years, it can't be something beyond this point. It has to be something uh, previous to this point. So, uh, the, which establishes either post or amillennialism is over against premillennialism. But as we, we've also indicated, uh, to the extent that we, we uh, uh, underscore the, 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 the character and the proportions of, of this crisis, this parousia crisis, uh, just before the parousia, uh, to, to that extent, we undermine the, the whole post-millennial uh, optimistic uh, uh, concept of the kingdom coming in glory uh, previous uh, to that. Let's take a uh, five minute uh, break.